Buffalo Business 510 students. Um, this is your chapter 6 um, video lecture. Um, we're going to be talking um, about data, databases, and business intelligence in this chapter. Okay, so it'll be in, it'll be in two sections, right? The first section we'll talk about data information and databases, right? Um, taking a look at the idea of relational databases, um, how um, you can drive uh, websites with data, um, what are some of the benefits of having good information, All right? And then in the second s section, we're going to talk about business intelligence. So um, we'll talk about data warehousing um, and we'll talk about um, data marts, data mining, um, which again is tied into databases, but it's a it's a different level of storing and retrieving data and a different level of um, asking different types of questions um, and getting different types of answers um, using, you know, in, in business intelligence. Okay, so section one, okay, um, there's, there are a lot of benefits to having high quality information for business. Um, and for pretty much every business that's out there, um, there's information that's generated in all different parts of your business, right? If you start to think about a business and some of the different ways they generate information, right? They could, they're generating information when they are um, doing re research and development activities. They're generating information when um, their marketing department is trying to set up and analyze uh, advertising campaigns. They're generating information when um, they are manufacturing their goods and when they are um, selling those goods to customers, right? Um, and of course, if there's any types of returns, you know, there's some sort of recall, right? That's all information from, you know, one end of the, of the company to the other that's, that's being generated and constantly being generated. Um, and with all of that information, um, you, in order to get, to have information um, that is good information um, that uh, employees can use to make decisions, right? You have to have not only a good information system to set that up, but also um, a good data um, database in the back end that can, uh, that's flexible and is actually set up to reflect the business decisions of the organization, okay? Um, and if you have a you know good quality information right you can get some really really good insight not only into how the business is performing but also paving the way for the business in the future okay so when we talk about high quality information right there's different um, there's different types of um, different Im I guess characteristics of information so granularity of um, information. Um, you can have information that is very detailed, right? You, you can get kind of summary information and then of course um, aggregate information and a lot of times these granularities have to do with the level of the organization in which they are being used. So um, for very detailed information probably going to be at the um, um, at the operations level, the ma where you're manufacturing, you're actually selling things to people. The summary level, you're looking at sort of the mid-level managers. Aggregate um, information is more for your strategic level um, executives, right, who have to see the whole organization, and not just the organization, but also seeing um, what's going on outside the organization, pulling that information in so that they can make decisions based on that also. Um, for formats, right, there's a lot of different formats that your, your information can take, right? Once, your, inform once your, your information has been, you know, processed and saved, right, it could be in documents, presentations, spreadsheets, right, alerts, dashboards, things like that. And then, of course, information levels, right? You can have information that's about individuals, right, maybe in your HR department, um, information about each employee, right? You can have information about different departments, right? Your finance, accounting, um, sales, operations, right? And then of course, at the enterprise level, the whole organization, okay? Different, there's different types of information, okay? You, a lot of the information that's generated across the organization is transactional information. Um, and this is information, you know, 
um, about um, single business processes, right, when you're manufacturing goods and you're keeping track of the raw materials that are coming into the manufacturing process, you're keeping track of the um, the uh, unfinished goods as they go through the manufacturing process, and then of course the um, the finished goods as they they travel from you know from the the organization to uh, you know to retail stores, and then finally to your ultimate customer, right? All of that creates transactional information. You have um, transactional information about actual sales. You have um, so you know anything that is kind of about the daily operational tasks of the organization creates transactional information. Um, analytical information, on the other hand, is all of your organizational information, right? And when you're you, you analytical information includes transactional information in it, um, but a lot of times it is summarized or uh, and. Um, uh, viewed with other outside information, information about, if you guys remember the five forces model, right, all of the different forces that the organization is um, operating um, operating under, right, all of those, those getting information about those different forces, right, so that your executive level employees can make good strategic decisions about the future of the organization, okay, and that comes, you know, that comes under your analytical information. Okay, um, and this is just giving an example of some of, um, you know, some transactional information, right? Sales, airline tickets, packing slips, that's, that's all transactions, right? Your analytical information, again, if you take a look at some of this stuff, right? This is more summary level, right? Um, you have sales receipts for transactional, but sales projections, right, based on maybe uh, forecasting um, analyses, um, that take into account your past uh, your past sales, right? Um, future growth, right? What what we have projected as future growth. Looking at trends, you're when you're looking at trends, um, you're looking at past data, and you're starting to see um, correlations between uh, between things. You're starting to see. Remember when I talked about the um, the marketing example um, where um, the uh, a grocery store had um, found out that beer and diapers were selling together um, every on Friday nights. There were a lot of people that were buying beer and diapers together, right? It's one of those things that it, it doesn't really make sense to us, but if you have the data that tells you this is actually happening, right? That's a trend that's actually happening. Um, then the business can react to that trend, right? They can make changes to maybe um, take advantage of that, right? So it just giving this is just giving you some examples of the types of data in each of those uh, each of those categories. Um, in, timeliness of information, um, having information um, either real time in real time is you know quite expensive, right? Um, I can think of um, you know one example uh, where real time information is quite important. A stockbroker, right? Somebody that has to keep track of um, maybe minute by minute stock prices, right? Because they're looking for for changes. You know, having real time information in that line of work makes sense, and it's not, it not only makes sense, but it is probably a requirement to doing your job correctly. Okay, um, but real time information and having systems that provide that is um, can be quite expensive. So the business. The, the business has to decide, and probably your managers have to decide, is real-time information something that we have to have, right? And if it is, how do we get systems that will provide that to us? And we'll provide that information to the people that need it, okay? Information quality is definitely a huge, a huge issue, right? You don't want to make decisions based on bad information, okay? You want to make sure that um, the information that you're getting um, reflects what's actually happening so that when you're making decisions based on that, um, you're not making incorrect decisions, okay? So that's definitely a huge, uh, a very important part aspect of this, right? And some of the characteristics of your high quality information, right, include that it is um, accurate, complete, consistent, um, unique, and timely.
accurate um, is actually looking at is the are the values correct right is your customers or, or supplier name spelled correctly right um, is a sales amount recorded properly is it is it correct right um, complete is looking at uh, making sure that um, your information isn't your your records or your information is not missing stuff things like addresses right some um, some residential addresses have apartment numbers some business um, addresses have like suite numbers right if you don't have that part of the addresses right it's it's definitely incomplete um, consistency right if you're taking your real um, fine detailed information and you're creating summaries based on that so that uh, upper upper your middle managers and upper level um, management um, are looking at more summaries uh, summary of that information right is the summary information does that match the detailed information right is it actually you know consistent with one another because if it's inconsistent then something happened when you when you took that detailed information and created summaries out of it and that's bad <laughs> your information should um, should be consistent across all you know all all um, uh, all uses of it okay um, is it unique um, so is each transaction entity and event only represented once in the information. And when we say entities, we, we're thinking about um, like customers, suppliers, um, products, things like that. Um, so if you have an org if you have a setup in your organization where um, you have duplicate customer information, right? And this you probably you might have seen this actually uh, as a customer. Um, if you get if you move and you change your address um, with a company you're doing business with right and you start to receive information from them not only at your new address but also still receiving some information maybe it's the junk mail or whatever at your old address that means that that company had your information in more than one place in their organization and when they updated it they only updated it in one place all right, that's obviously not unique, and, and it also gets into consistency, right? Um, you know that information is not it, their update didn't wasn't complete, and now they have uh, you know a correct and incorrect address for you. Okay, and then timeliness, right? Um, how you know if you need real time information, right? Are you getting the information you need? How um, how often is the information updated, right? Is it hourly, daily, weekly, um, and and is that update schedule you know hourly daily weekly does that meet the needs of the people that are using the information right that's you know that's pretty important now this is an example of low quality information okay this is like a spreadsheet here it's a spreadsheet may it just says ID so it's it could be for suppliers it could be for customers right but it has a first and last name is probably customers right and you'll you can see um, in number one, where up here, where it says missing information, right? There is there's customers without last without first names, right? So how you know how do we know how to address these customers, right? Other incomplete information, right? Where for street addresses we have part of the street address but not the whole thing. Um, over here, having duplicate information, right? Um, ID number 115 and 116 right you got kind of go through that information it's pretty much the same except for some reason um, you know one of one of these Jenny's is Roberts versus Robert but they live at the same address so there's a pretty good chance that it's the same person but we got you know inc inconsistent information right and it became duplicated um, potential wrong information um, so you take a look at um, number 114 Jeff Jones right and he's got the same address for his phone and fax right as well as going across for his email right obviously the email is definitely wrong um, because it's a phone number that's in there um, the other two you know does he actually have a set have um, a fax set up on his regular telephone line I mean that's possible right but if it's not if it's that's not the way it is then that information is incomplete uh, is is a uh, is 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 um, not accurate of course and then um, incomplete information you can see that um, some of these customers for their phone and fax have the full um, you know the full area code 
and that for Jenny Roberts, we don't have an area code, right? Depending on, for most companies, having an area code is quite important because even in, you can think of it, even here in Southern California, right? How many area codes do we have? Um, and having a, a number without an area code means that you, you um, probably can't get a hold of that person. Okay, so this is just looking at some of the possible um, examples of that low quality information that we talked about in the previous, um, in the previous, uh, okay, and when it comes to um, low quality information, right, there's um, some major sources of po uh, possible low quality information, right? Customers might intentionally enter inaccurate information because they want to protect their privacy, right? I don't know if you've ever um, gone to download um, software and maybe um, uh, the organization requires, I know Adobe, if you download um, any of their, um, their trial versions of their software, you have to create um, uh, an account within their, uh, their system, right? Um, and I just want to try, you know, Dreamweaver or whatever. So um, it could be that I don't really want them to have my information. I'm not doing business with them. They just want to keep track of who's downloading their stuff, right? So as a customer, maybe I'm intentionally putting information that's not correct for me. Um, you might have different entry standards and formats. So maybe, um, maybe there's one... Um, uh, in one, as a customer, right, one way of me entering information um, asks for um, my middle name and the other one doesn't, right? Um, it, the way that it's stored, if it's stored in different ways, right, maybe one stores my information, my name, first name, last name, and the other one does last name, first name, or something. Um, people that are actually within the organization, um, data, you know, data entry people and like sales people or whatever, if they enter information that's abbreviated, right, maybe they're taking notes on um, a technical issue that a customer's having and they put abbreviations that they understand, but when that information goes to another employee in the organization, right, um, maybe it's, it's harder for that person to understand so they don't really know exactly what happened or they put in um, information that's just not not correct either by accident or maybe just again abbreviations would probably be to save time um, and then when we um, talked about information at the strategic level of the organization um, that external information or third party it it most likely is not in a format that is usable by our systems within the organization um, and it's it's probably going to have some inconsistencies maybe inaccuracies and errors right so um, maybe uh, you have um, you're missing information for a customer list you purchased right um, you have to figure out how to deal with the that type of information because it's coming from somebody else and somebody else's system and there's a good chance it's not going to match with what what we do Okay, um, some of the costs of using low quality information, right? Um, you, you, you can't accurately track your customers, okay? Because um, you don't have good information for them. You have difficulty identifying valuable customers, right? You can't, and, and for any business, right, we want to know who our valuable customers are. We want to know who the people are that, that spend a lot of money with us, spend money, you know, often, right? Um, and if we can't track those people, how do we know when they disappear or when they decide to stop, you know, stop buying from us so that we can go back and say, hey, why don't you come back? Um, I mean, you, you can lose valuable customers that way. Um, when you have salespeople, right, if they can't identify potential sell, selling opportunities, right, because they're getting information that is not of good quality, right, marketing to non-existent customers, right, when we talked about that idea of um, putting, uh, putting uh, inaccurate data um, as a customer because you want to protect your privacy, right, so they're marketing, they're sending marketing information to somebody that doesn't exist because you ha they have bad information, right. It's, you could have, they could have, possibly have uh, information, difficulty tracking revenue. And that's really important. You want to know where your revenue sources are coming from, right? You want to know where, um, what parts of the business are doing well and what parts of the business are not so that you can address those issues. Uh, and then, of course, you can't build strong customer relationships when you don't have um, good tracking information on your customers, right? Um, in the, in, um, 
in uh, chapter 9, uh, I think, actually no, it's chapter 8, we're going to talk about um, CRM systems, right? And that, that type of system is really important for building those customer relationships. Okay, some of the benefits, right? High quality information, you're going you're gonna to be making better decisions, obviously. Um, and if you're making good decisions, it's definitely going to positively affect the organization's bottom line, right? You make good decisions, it's going to positively affect the organization, you're going to be making more money, right? <laughs> okay, so one, all information across the organization is stored in databases. Right, and a database is, uh, it maintains information about different objects, events, people, and places. Okay, so objects are things like inventory, events, like transactions, things that actually happen. Um, people include employees, it could include um, suppliers, it could include uh, customers, right? And then, of course, places, right? So, um, let's see. Okay, now... There's a distinct difference between a database and a database management system, okay? When, when a user is, is asking, a, is actually using, a, um, when you have a user who is running, um, running a sales report, say, they want to get the sales for the past quarter. Um, they, they're running the report, What they're actually accessing the database management system, which is where you would, you go through the database management system to make changes to or ask questions of the database. Okay, so when a lot of times people talk about databases, they think they're, they're sort of assuming that the database itself does the things that your DBMS does, and that's not, it's not true. Okay, so um, when the user is doing anything to the database, it's going through the DBMS, right? When they are creating, reading, updating, and deleting data, it's going through the DBMS. Okay. Um, now, some kind of key terms in regards to relational databases. And there are different types of databases. Um, relational databases are... Um, one type of database, there's object oriented, there's others, but we focus on relational databases because a vast majority of the operational databases that are out there are relational. Um, so we'll focus on that. Um, now again, let's just talk a little bit about some basic concepts, right? A data element is your smallest or basic unit of information, right? Um, it's it, It's it's a one snapshot or one small piece of data. So like a sales figure, you know, $250,000, right? Um, that's a, a data element. Um, when, when you, when databases are created, um, they, in order to design the database, um, you have what's called a data model, right? So before you create a database or start to use it, you have to think of the types of information you want to keep track of, right? And how those, how that information um, is related to one another. That's why it's called a relational database because um, one of the key parts of, or the key strengths of a relational database is that you have information about different things, right? Customer, you have a customer table, employees, products, sales, um, you know, whatever. Um, and all of those different tables or those different types of information are encapsulated within tables that are connected to one another, okay? Um, and your data model is where the planning goes into figuring out how those things are related to one another, what information you want to actually keep about your business, um, as well as um, reflecting the rules, uh, the business rules of the organization. Okay, so making sure that your data model and the way that your database is structured reflects the way you actually do business is a super important part of, uh, of designing the database. Um, every database has what's called metadata. Um, and what metadata, metadata means uh, data about data. Okay, uh, meta means uh, about itself, basically. Um, Metadata provides the structure for the database. So when you are 
after you figure out your data model, right, you sort of uh, create a, um, a model um, of what the database is actually going to be when you're, at, you're creating the database itself. Um, you, you are creating tables and you're giving them names and you're, you're putting in uh, fields or information about each, you know, so for example, let's take a customer, right? There's certain things that every business probably wants to keep about their customers, you know, first name, last name, uh, you know, correct address, all the different fields for address. That, that would be um, the, the, the fields within the, the, um, the customer uh, table. Okay, and the metadata keeps track of the the structure of the database itself. Okay, um, so every database has metadata. Um, a data dictionary um, compiles all of that metadata, right, um, about the elements in the data model. So it, it's a it's one place of looking at all of the the structure elements of your your database. Okay. Um, so in a data model, right, we talk about um, entities, attributes, and records, okay? So, um, and we'll, we'll actually uh, take a look at, um, at some of these things. But an entity is just, a, you know, person, place, thing, transaction, or event where you want to have information w about what you want to store information. So again, from a lot of businesses, it's going to be things like products, sales, um, orders, uh, customers, uh, suppliers, um, different warehouses, right, so that you can store where, um, you know, where s particular products are, are coming from and going to, right? Um, and an entity, when you actually create the database, becomes a table, okay? Um, now, an attribute, um, once you figure out what entities or tables you want to have, you also need to figure out what um, what information about each one of those entities you're, you want to save, right? So what is it about your, what information about your products do you need to keep track of? What information about your suppliers and your customers and your employees, right? Those would be considered attributes of those entities or, or fields in your table, right? So when you, attributes is the data model term, field would be um, the actual database term, okay? Oops. And then of course, um, a record, right? So um, an example, a record would be a, um, I guess a row in each one of the tables where you're keeping track of information for one person or one place or one thing. So you can kind of think of, um, the the University of Laverne um, database right has information about me as a, an instructor right has information about you guys as um, students right they have to keep track of that information because otherwise how do they know um, who's teaching what class who's taking what class what grades are associated with those classes right they have to keep track of all that um, but me as a faculty member right there is a table somewhere in their database that either says employee or faculty and I am a row in there. They have my first name, my last name, my address, right? All the information they need to keep about me as an employee. I would be a single record in that employee table or faculty table. Same thing with you guys. So you might have a student table, right? And each one of you guys has a, a record in there that has all of those attributes about you as a student. Okay. Um, so within a data model, again, the relational databases, the, one of the key um, aspects of this is that you are taking those, those tables, right, the student table, the faculty table, the class table, whatever, um, and that you have information about one, one thing in each one of those tables, but you need to create relationships between those tables. Okay, a primary key is a unique identifier for an individual record. Okay, so an example of that, right? Um, I have, as an employee or a faculty member, whatever, I don't know how they save my information, of the University of Laverne, I have a, um, an employee number, okay? Um, and that employee number is a unique identifier for me as a faculty member or as an employee. Um, now, they could, they could, they could use my first 
or my last or a combination of my first and last name as unique identifier, right? But there's always the chance that somebody else named Nicole Lytle is going to, you know, will possibly end up in the system. And then there's going to be, you know, um, confusion, right? Same thing with students, right? Um, they can't use your first name or your last name to uniquely identify you, right? Because there's always the chance that somebody will enroll in, in the university and may have your first and last name, right? So names are a possibility, but they're usually not a good identifier. That's why you guys have a student number when you walk into any of the services here on campus, right? What do they ask you for when they want to see your information? They ask for your student number, right? So that is your, your primary key in your student table would be the student number because nobody's student number is exactly the same, right? They make sure that everybody has their own unique one. Um, a foreign key is a primary key from one table that connects um, that connects that data to that information to the other table. So for ex example, um, you guys have your student table with your student information, everything about you as a student first, last name, you know, physical address, um, emergency contact, you know, whatever they're keeping about students. In order to connect you as a student to the classes that you take every every semester, you know, every semester, every term, right? They, when they connect, when they create a um, a class list, right? Maybe they have a se there's more than one section of business 510 every quarter. I think there's like two or three um, every every term. Um, at least the you know in in uh, like uh, winter or spring and um, and fall. Um, so when they create three different sections of 510, they have to keep track of which students are in which one. And they do that by linking your primary key for your student table, which would be your student ID, to the class list. Okay, that connects your student information, your name, your address, all of that from your student table where all that information resides to the class list so that they can compile a list of the students that are in each class. Same idea for faculty, right? How do you know what faculty is teaching what class? Because they, they, in that um, that table that keeps track of, you know, different sections of business 510 for um, the fall, you know, the fall term, right? They have in this class all of your guys' student IDs are associated with this section we were taking. My um, employee number is associated with this section as the faculty member teaching it. So that's kind of how primary keys and foreign keys work. Okay. Um, databases have a lot of advantages from a business perspective, right? They are very flexible, okay, because of the, that primary key, foreign key kind of connection, right? You, um, you can create, um, you, you're limited to records based on the database, um, how robust it is and how, um, how many records it can actually take. but. Um, Enterprise level databases like Oracle, DB2, um, those those levels of databases um, tend to um, tend to be able to take you know thousands or millions of records, right? And they're they're quite flexible. Um, they they tend to be able to be scalable, right? So if you create a data a, a system with a database when you are sort of a medium sized company and all of a sudden you know, it's kind of like when Twitter became really, really popular, right? Um, which was probably two or three years ago, right? Before that, Twitter existed, but it wasn't, it, it, it just, you know, something changed to where it just became um, a major social networking tool. Um, and at that time, right, they had to be able to keep track of the increase in Twitter users, the Twitter, the, um, uh, the tweets that those users were making, right? So they had to be able to, um, to scale up their database so that it could it, it could save more information. Um, they also had to make sure that the database could handle the amount of users that were using it, right? Because it went from you know the small proportion to in within six months or a year, right, to this huge influx of users. Um, reduced information redundancy, right? Because relational databases require you to have information in one place, right? So your student information is in one table, your full information, right? First name, last name, all that stuff is in one table in one place in the database, 
Okay, so that when we go back and we, you know, you update your name for a marriage or you uh, change your address or you change whatever, um, they, when they go in to change it, it only has to be done in one place so you don't have inconsistency or anything like that. Um, it helps to make sure that you're getting better quality information, right? You remember that bad quality um, information example that we showed earlier in the slides? Um, one of the things was, um, you know, one of the examples was having a, a telephone address in an email, um, in an email uh, record, right, in an email part in the record, right. And most databases, um, if you go and you start, you create a new account, right, you're going online and you've never had Twitter before and they're going to ask you for your email, right. There's a certain, um, there's a certain way that emails are a, like kind of like a template that every email has to have. It's basically like, something ampersand or the at sign something dot something right so um, you know my your my email address here on campus is Nicole dot Lytle at the ampersand at Laverne dot edu right um, and so that's the structure of a of a an email and you can you can make your um, your database so that it won't accept an email if it doesn't fit that structure. You're not really, you're still not really sure if it's, um, if it is a correct email address, but at least you know that it's at least in the right structure. So that increases the quality, possibly the quality of the data you're getting. And then of course, information security um, is definitely increased when you're using databases. Okay. Um, so when you're looking at flexibility, right, a well-designed database, it should definitely handle changes very quickly and easily. It should provide users with different views because not every user in a system needs to see everything. For example, um, the, um, the Laverne database, right, um, people in uh, finance need to see a, um, well, in financial aid maybe, need to see a different part of your guys' record than maybe people in, um, in your department right they the, the information that those two different users in that system need to see is going to be different sh snapshots of your student information M me as the instructor right I get a different snapshot of the type of information that I see about you as students in my class okay um, and so you can kind of say well this user has access to this part this part this part of the database and nothing else and maybe there's parts of the database that I can see, but I can't make changes to, right? I need the information, but, I, you know, I don't have the, I, there's no need for me to make changes to it, right? Um, making sure that you only have one physical view, which is actually where the data is stored. Um, having one place, one physical place in, in the memory of the database, right, in this the system, the, the piece of hardware that stores your database, having one place that you are physically storing the information. But you can have multiple logical views, which again kind of comes back to providing users with different views. Logical views um, is, is actually giving people different access of that same information. It's still, it's kind of like uh, pointers to that particular information. It's all looking at that same physical location, but it's different views for different users or different business needs. Okay, you have, uh, again, the scalability and performance, right? Um, scalability is how, how the, well the system can adapt to increase demand, right? So if you, um, the, the, um, the uh, database for um, large online companies like um, eBay, like Amazon, like Google, right? Um, they have huge um, server farms and they have multiple databases that keep all of that information that they're constantly collecting. Um, and they have to have very they have to have very robust systems that can handle the amount of demand, right? So you can kind of think of um, uh, Google, right? Google probably gets like hundreds of hits a second, right? Worldwide. Right? So they have to be able to handle that information. Um, and if you're logged into Google, like maybe you logged into to Gmail and then you go and do a Google search, it's actually associating that search information with your username. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they have to be able to save that information so that um, they keep track of that. <coughs> 
for performance, right? It's looking at how quickly it can perform a certain process or transaction, right? How many seconds does it take to um, process an order, right? We all know that there's a certain, you know, after a while, you get start to get worried. You know, you, you hit uh, submit your order, right? And um, so it's, it's telling you, you know, it's processing, 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 right? How long does it take for it to actually come back and tell you the order has been processed? Here's your order number, you know, thank you for your, um, you know, thank you for your, uh, your order kind of thing. And again, data redundancy is just having duplication of data or storing the same information in different places, right? And you, if you have data redundancy, you can have what's called inconsistency, which I talked about before. Having um, different information in those multiple places about the same entity, about the same uh, customer, employee, etc. information quality right um, and when I remember when I talked about this idea of the the um, the email addresses right making sure that the incoming email addresses fit a certain template right kind of same thing for phone numbers US phone numbers right they have um, 10 digits right they have a three digit um, uh, area code a three digit uh, prefix and a four digit um, suffix right that's 10 10 digits Right, so you gotta make sure you know if you're gonna keep phone numbers, you don't want them to not have the area code. So you make sure that they're giving you ten digits, right? That's called an an integrity constraint. We know what a, a um, what a good email address or a good phone number, generally a good phone number, looks like. We can create rules within the database that say that we can't, we're not gonna accept email addresses if they don't fit this template. We're not going to accept phone numbers that don't have all 10 digits, right? And that can definitely increase the quality of the information you get in, in your database. Um, increase security, right? Um, there's, there's different types of security features. Um, pass, you know, password, username is kind of the basic uh, uh, secure level of security, right? Making sure that every user in a database has a password and username combination. Um, different access levels and controls, right? So when you have different types of users, and I talked a little bit about this too, but when you have different types of users within an organization, right? So you can you can think of the of the University of Laverne again. Um, you know, you as a student only have um, access to your individual student information, right? You can't see my, you know, my faculty information except for, you know, like name and um, you know some basic information right you guys can't can't get like my home address and stalk me or something <laughs> Not that you want to but I'm just saying there's certain information you have access to same thing with me on this end right there's certain information about you as a student that I have access to but there's other information I don't because I just don't need it to do my job right so you can set up these things within the database so that um, you know they, they're only getting access to certain type of information and that some of that information you're only actually being you, you can only do certain things right you guys as students can see your grades but you can't actually make changes to them right um, you can't write your own grade right so you get what's called read only access to your grades okay so I mean it's just different 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 uh, people within an organization get different access uh, levels and control. Okay. Data-driven websites is, you know, an interactive website that is updated with relevant, uh, that with information that's relevant to the needs of customers using a database. So I'll give you an example of a, of a website that is driven, um, that is driven by data, right? If you've ever used eBay before, um, the thing about the auction format of eBay, right, is that it's really important to get up to the minute information or up to the second information about the um, the um, the bidding that's happening on an item you want, right? So I don't know if you've ever used eBay, but when you use it and you're doing the um, the auction format where people are bidding um, and you can possibly be outbid and lose an, lose an item that you want, right? If you don't get up to the second information about bids, right, somebody can just kind of sneak in and outbid you. I've had that happen more than once. You know, there's something I want to get and, you know, at the last second, like last three seconds, somebody puts in a bid and outbids me and I lose the item, right? But um, 
if I didn't have that information, right, it maybe they, they do it within 10 seconds and I have time to go in uh, and create and, 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 and bid um, higher so that I can actually win, win the information. That's a data-driven website, right? It's keeping track of um, these multiple levels of information, the time left in the auction, the bidding, right? It's also keeping track of things like um, if, if the seller creates what's called a reserve, where they want to make sure that they get at least that maybe they start at 99 cents but I I won't sell this item for less than ten dollars if it doesn't reach ten dollars nobody buys it right that's that's called a reserve um, so it keeps track of whether the reserve has been met or not because if the reserve hasn't been met then the item doesn't actually get sold right and it'll tell you as a buyer on there the reserve has not been met so you know that um, that price that the bidder has put in there is not high enough to actually purchase the item. You don't necessarily know what the um, reserve is, but you know when it's been met and when it hasn't. Okay. So, you know, uh, just doing basic product searches on the internet, right? So they use the example of Zappos, which I, um, I believe is a shoe, um, a shoe retail, uh, retail shoe seller, okay? Um, when you look in, you're looking for a particular type of shoe, right? You, you maybe you put in something about, um, you know, for the ladies like a, a you know, a certain type of, of um, high heel pump or something. You 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 know hit submit. It sends that search query to the Zappos web server, um, which is connecting to the database management system and the database. Um, it's basically asking um, a question of that database, and then um, once you get the results back, right? It it shows those results on a web page for you as the customer, right? I mean, that's an example of a website that's driven, it, it's built with, you know, it's driven by data, right? You, um, you, you get information about a search um, and it's displayed on the page for you. So a lot of different, there's some, exa there's some um, advantages to data-driven um, websites, right? Um, it can be easy to manage the content because the content comes directly from your database. Okay, so one, if you have a good database and you're managing your, your information well in your database, then it's basically, um, um, the management is basically taken care of um, on the website because you're already doing that. Um, it's easy to store large amounts of data because again, it's in the database. All of the, the information that you're using is in the database, right? And because it's coming directly from from the database, right? You're not getting any those human errors because the information is being managed by the database, um, by the uh, the uh, the rules that we set forth when we created the database, right? And you're not actually, you know, um, having to deal with a person, right? And and of course, it's going to be faster. You you um, you know you run a search query in a uh, you know like that example of Zappos. You run that search query, right? It's going directly to the database in the product catalog to pull up information that matches the um, the the search that you just ran okay okay so there's examples of uh, websites driven with data and you kind of you guys remember your your pivot tables when you created those for your Excel spreadsheet right um, uh, you have um, you know, a web page that is driven by um, a database. And th this example here, this is an example of a, a Microsoft um, Access database. But you can see different um, tables, right, that have, you know, customer information, order information, you know, all of the products, right? Um, all of that information is in these tables, right? And these little lines here, these are the relationships from one table to another right primary key foreign key kind of thing um, and then once you get that data um, you can run analyses on that data like you know for example using uh, exporting that data from the ac the access database into um, into an Excel spreadsheet where you can create things like pivot tables to get answers to business questions okay um, so let's go ahead and talk about um, business intelligence okay uh, all right, so we're going to talk now about, we talked about 
databases, da database management systems, kind of ha the structure of relational databases. Now we're going to get into using data warehouses, data marts, things like that, which is actually a different type of storage mechanism for, um, for providing business intelligence. Okay, um, so data warehousing itself, data warehouses um, are, you can think of them as archival type of databases. Okay, they're, they're databases, but they're structured to keep information that isn't going to change. So you're kind of archiving your, your regular operation, tra operational data, all those transactions, new customers, customers making changes to their accounts, new orders that are placed, new orders that are fulfilled, you know, all of that information, those transactions and stuff that are happening that we talked about in your other, your regular databases, right? After a certain point in time, an organization that has a data warehouse will pull sort of a snapshot of that database and will um, will uh, archive that data in the data warehouse. Okay, um, so a data warehouse helps to start to look at um, less about is less about those day to day operations because it's um, archived data and more about what's happening um, overall in the business. Right, um, and so having a data warehouse which is separate from your operational databases, make sure that you can have decision making um, without disrupting what's going on in your day to day operations because it's a separate database, it's a separate um, system. Okay, a data warehouse, you know, your book's ex um, definition it's a log logical collection of information gathered from many different operational databases and supports anal business analysis activities and decision making tasks. So a data warehouse keeps information about every database and every piece of information across your organization. Everything's in that data warehouse. Um, it also keeps track of information from outside the organization also. So you can get information about your uh, the market, information about your um, your um, others within your, your industry, information about, um, you know, just outside information and you can add and supplement your internal information in your data warehouse with outside information, right? And again, the, you know, the reason you have data warehouses is just to make sure that you have one place for decision-making purposes, right? Now, um, when you are creating biz, um, data um, databases, Right, um, you have to do what's called extraction, transformation, and loading, or ETL. Right, where you're actually extracting the information from either your internal operational databases or any external sources you're getting. It transforms that data to make sure that it matches the way that you store information in your data warehouse. If you're getting inf even your um, internal operational databases, they might not match up with how you store that information in your data um, data warehouse. And if you're getting information from external sources, there's a good chance it won't match. So you have to go and make changes to that data so that it is in the right format so that when we put it into the data warehouse, it fits. Okay? And then of course this loading, right? Um, loading that information actually into the data warehouse itself. Okay? Um, now, most organizations are going to have one data warehouse. Right? But they might have what are called data, multiple data marts. Right? And the idea is that not everybody needs to see everything in the data warehouse. Okay? Um, and so you can have what are these subsets of data warehouse information. Right? Maybe there's certain information that our finance department needs to have. Or there's certain information that um, our home office needs to have and you know, our Southern California um, re retail locations need to get access to. You can create data marts that kind of slice and dice the information in the data warehouse so that e users are only getting what they need. This helps to focus the information um, and making sure that you're not giving everybody access to everything, which is a security issue. Um, but it also helps with um, taking the load off the data warehouse itself, right? So if you have like thousands of employees and they all are making requests on one single data warehouse, that's a huge load. That, that data warehouse has to contend with, right? If you have data marts and people are, are using data marts instead of everybody going to the data warehouse, it helps to alleviate that load. 
Okay, so this 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 um, slide takes a look at what what's actually going on when you are creating um, data marts. So again, it shows some of the internal databases, right? Just an example of some of the internal and external database um, information that you might be getting, right? It's doing that um, ETL process to get the data the data from internal and external into the right format. Um, and then actually loading it into your data warehouse, where, where again, your data warehouse is one big database that's gonna have all of this information, right? And when you have different data marts, right? You're, again, you're doing that ETL, because you're still moving information from one database to another, so you're still doing that ETL process, um, but you are loading subsets of that huge data, of that huge complete data warehouse. Multi-dimensional analysis is one type of, um, of analysis that you can do using a data warehouse or data marts. Um, it, and all, you know, all databases, um, relational databases, contain information in a series of two-dimensional tables, right? Um, in a data warehouse or data mart, right, you, your information is multi-dimensional. It can have different, layer, uh, different um, layers of information, okay? Um, and you can think of, think of a Rubik's Cube. Um, hopefully you guys are familiar with a Rubik's Cube. But if you look at a Rubik's Cube, right, it's, it's kind of, th it's three-dimensional, right? Not only does it have, you know, um, uh, it's not just one, one or two-dimensional information, right? It actually has that third dimension to give it um, kind of uh, a different type repre representation. Okay, um, and, and quite often when we think of multidimensional information in a data warehouse or data mart, we, we use this idea of a cube. And it, when they talk about a cube, it's kind of like um, a Rubik's Cube. Okay, so here we're actually looking at what does multidimensional information look like? Okay, so um, right, cube A is where we have the, the full kind of three-dimensional information. Right, so we have, um, and this one here might be marketing information. We're keeping track of mar marketing um, pr promotions, right? Different promotions, maybe a promotion um, to different, um, uh, two different uh, um, commercials, you know, commercials on television. Maybe one um, promotion where we're, we're putting out a, um, we're putting out a, uh, a coupon maybe, or in another promotion where maybe it is only um, QR readers, right? If, hopefully, if you know what a QR reader is, these QR codes are like um, rectangles that you, uh, with your smartphone, you download a QR reader app and you take a picture of it, it will take you to a website with more information about it, right? So maybe we have four different promotions going on, right? And we're, we want to we want to keep track of how those promotions affect different product lines that we have, as well as maybe those promotions um, affect their effect at different stores, right? So this is the three different dimensions of that data, right? And we want to get to a specific um, piece of information, right? So we're starting to, we want information only on the promotion two, right? And only on, and I can't even tell where that's at. It kind of looks like <laughs> it's in, um, okay, so it, it, it's actually product B store two for promotion three, right? Because that's, again, that multi-dimensional um, aspect is just having different, um, you know, different dimensions and being able to add that information together to get a, a more complete snapshot of what's going on. And you, um, you do this only in um, data warehouses because you're starting to get, because uh, you're getting all of that information from different parts of the organization and putting them in one place. Okay. Um, your data warehouse needs to have good information in it. The quality of the data has to be, could possibly be even higher than your operational databases. Um, if you have data that is missing information, that is inconsistent or incorrect, right? There has to be a way of cleaning, of um, cleansing or scrubbing, right? They, they call it either one, of fixing the issues within the data. Okay, and it may be, maybe you have real high quality information coming from your internal databases, but when you start to get information from outside sources, right, you have to contend with maybe having missing information or maybe having duplicate records. Remember when we looked at that, that record and we, we, um, we saw that there were two uh, Jenny Roberts, right, 
And when you go across and you look at it, it's the same person, only one's Robert and one's Robert, right? So that's obviously, you know, um, information that would have to be, we have to figure out which one is correct and which one do we want to discard, okay? And that's this cleansing or scrubbing um, of the data, okay? So this is another example of, you know, contact information, right? Um, let's see. Maybe, um... Maybe you have um, uh, decision make, you know, here for um, contacts, for um, uh, decision maker customer contact information, right, for marketing and sales. Um, and you take a look at the information that they have. Um, you know, is it um, is it correct? Is it in the same format between from one uh, database to another, right? Um, when you're looking at, you know, customers, right? Um, okay, so this example here is looking at all of these different aspects of maybe um, a business, right? Where um, account the billing system has the 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 accounts payable person within that organization. The customer service has the actual users, right? Because the customer service needs to get a track in, in contact with the users, billing needs to get in contact with the people that handle the money. Um, marketing and sales, right? They're gonna, they're gonna, they want to talk to the people that can make the decisions to actually purchase your items, right? So you have one, two, three, four, uh, five different contacts for one organization, um, for one you know organizational customer, right? It's obvious that they're all correct but they're different contacts for different purposes, right? And how do we go through and make sure that we keep that information because we need to know who's our billing person, who's, our, who's um, the users, right? Who makes the decisions um, when we add that information into our data warehouse, okay? Now, again, this is in a different example um, where a customer name from different operational systems, maybe sales has, um, has Pat Burton um, as a customer, right? And they have a different customer number they use in sales. Customer service has Patty Burton, and you'll notice that even the last name is spelled differently. Um, you know, a different customer number, right? In here for billing, right? They actually have two different customer numbers for this person, under Trisha Burton and Patricia Burton, right? So getting those inconsistencies and figuring out, is she a Pat? Is she a Patty? Is it Patricia? Trisha? Right? What's the correct spelling of her last name? And making sure that we get, we weed through all of those different um, formats of information and get the correct one. You'll even notice here in billing, um, when they're storing her information, it's first name, it's um, last name, first name versus first name, last name. You know, making sure that that's consistent so what we get in our data warehouse is correct. Okay, and this is just an example of what happens, the different things that happen when um, your information cleansing or scrubbing, right? You're dealing with missing records or attributes, redundant records, missing keys or other required data, right? If you have uh, customers without, um, without um, you know, customer numbers, um, you have erroneous relationships or references, right? So. Um, if you, you're, you're pulling information from one relational database to another, the way that they store their information in, in one database might not be the same as the way you do it. And then, of course, inaccuracies. These are just some examples of the cost of, um, of, inf of having c accurate and complete information. Okay, so you have 100% completeness. Everything, everything is filled out across the database completely. Okay? or 100% accurate, right? And a lot of times, you don't want to ever have, <laughs> um, you know, uh, inaccurate and incomplete data. This is a bad place to be in the matrix, okay? But a lot of times, you might be in one of these two areas because to get 100% complete information and 100% accurate information is very, very expensive. So maybe you know that you have um, 100% complete, but there are some errors in the information. Or maybe you have very incomplete information, but it's all accurate, right? Usually you kind of want to be somewhere down here, right? 
sort of having a, um, you want to have um, as accurate as possible, obviously, um, but maybe um, there might be some incomplete information that you just kind of um, have to put, you know, have to put like a zero or something in there because you, you just didn't have that information to start with. Okay. Once you have your database or your data warehouse set up, um, you can start to do things called, um, you can start to do analyses um, and data mining is one, you know, one kind of category of analysis. Um, data mining itself is analyzing data to extract information that you did, can't get by just looking at the raw data. You start to look at things like trends and patterns, right? That marketing example with the beer and diapers um, sold together in one order on Fridays, right? That is some, that's the type of pattern that you would get or trend that you start to look at um, and actually see using data mining, right? And there's different techniques in data mining and there's a whole, you know, there's a lot of different tools that can come under that category. Um, so you can do things like classification, estimation. Um, classification is where you're assigning records into one of a set of pre, uh, predefined classes. So maybe you have different levels of customers, right? And you're classifying your customers by those different levels. Estimation is where you're determining values for an unknown continuous um, behavior or estimated future value. So you're sort of, you don't know what it is, but you're sort of estimating what it could be. Um, affinity grouping is you're starting to get things that, that sort of belong together. Um, you know, what stuff goes together. And um, let's see. And then clustering is where you are, um, you have a heterogeneous population of records, a set of, a population of records that are essentially the same um, into a number of more uh, homogeneous subgroups. So you're putting them into groups, you're starting to separate them out into groups that are not the same. Right, so you have um, a certain a certain uh, customer segment. Right, it could be um, you know uh, young you know young people or young men from you know eighteen to twenty five. For certain markets, that's a super super important um, customer uh, customer classification. Right, so you you start to pull out these uh, th these. Uh, you know, male, 18 to 25 year old males, right? And you start to put them into um, different groups that uh, that start to separate them out, okay? Um, so when you're starting to un uncover some of those trends and patterns, right? You're, you're dealing with different types of data, right? You have structured data, something that's data that's already in a database or spreadsheet. You might have unstructured data. Um, it can, you know, you might have text documents, PDF, voicemails, emails that are not actually in a database or spreadsheet. Um, you can do text mining, where you're, um, you're analyzing unstructured data to find trends and patterns in words and sentences. Um, maybe web mining, where you're looking at unstructured data associated with websites to identify, you know, how customers uh, behave on your website and how it is that they navigate through your website, right? How do they... Um, how do they choose to go from one page to another? What buttons are they hitting? Um, you know, do they hit the back button all the time? You know, how, that type of stuff. Okay, and there's, for data man, mining analysis, um, the capabilities, of, of course, include those cluster analyses, um, association detection, right, where it's looking at um, the degree to which variables are related and the nature and frequency of the relationship. So, um, looking at um, two different things happening and trying to figure out are those things related, maybe a cause and effect type of relationship, right? Um, and then statistical analyses, this could be correlations, distri distributions, calculations, variance analysis, things like that. Um, so this is an example of a cluster analysis, right? Um, you're starting to look at things like um, cut consumer goods by content, brand loyalty, similarity, right, uh, product, uh, let's see, uh, retail store layouts and sales performances, um, database relationships and management information systems, right, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to create these, these groups of information that are, um, that are similar to one another, right, and the farther they are, like this blue group here, 
um, is, is very different from the green group right but it's a bit more similar to the red group because you can actually see that in this in this diagram it's closer the red group is closer to the b blue group than the green group is closer to the is is, is to the green group the blue group um and, and and obviously the red and the green are are they're they're distinct and different but they're still um, more similar to one another than they either of them are to the blue group. So right, you can use, you use this kind of spatial diagram to figure out um, clusters of information of data that is similar and how they're different from one another. Okay, association detection is looking at um, one good example is that market basket analysis that that. Um, that example of the beer and diapers, that's a market basket analysis. You're looking at what are people buying in together in one order, right? And I've, I think I've talked a little bit about Netflix and Amazon. They both do have what are called recommender systems, right? So you go into Amazon and you're looking up a CD, right? If you scroll down um, about halfway through the page, um, it actually shows you people that purchase this item, this CD, also purchase this CD, right? And if you purchase those two CDs together, um, you know, you will give you like three bucks off your order, right? They that's called a ma a market basket analysis, right? They're figuring out what do people buy together, and then they're using it to create to to create this recommender system that makes recommendations based on what other people buy together. Okay, different types of statistical analyses um, and some of those analyses are functions like information correlations, distributions, calculations, variance analysis um, and for, with statistical analyses you can do forecasts which are predictions on the basis of time series information um, and time series information is time stamped information collected at a certain time at a certain point right so um, a certain frequency okay Okay, and a lot of a lot of um, companies have this issue, right? They have all of this data, but they don't know how to turn that data into information. So they could be called data rich but information poor, right? Um, and just the fact that um, businesses have all of this data, it's coming from all over the place, right? Um, they're saying that by 2010, you know, the information that's coming in is going to double, and generally the amount of data that's generated is doubling just about every year um, and it could be even faster you know we could we could look at that doubling happening at monthly right and with all of that information if you can't if you can't turn that information that that data into usable information into business intelligence then it's, it's useless right and business intelligence is the way it, you know is obviously the solution for that um, but it's giving you know business users um, get data analysis that is you know reliable, consistent, understandable, and easily manipulated. Okay. And you, this is just an example of some of the questions you can actually ask, right? Business a business intelligence can get you in qu answers to questions that are more detailed, right? So we look in here, right? We start with the question: Why are sales below target? because we sold less in the western region right so then we look back and say okay so why did we sell less in the west right the answer is because sales of a particular product dropped in the western region right why did those sales drop because we had an increase in customer complaints so in the western region for product X there were a lot of customers that were unsatisfied so sales dropped there um, and you know why did the complaints increase because late deliveries went up 60 percent people were not getting their items it just happened to be that it was a product X they were not getting their items in a timely manner right so we can start to sort of dig deep into the data to get to actually find out that um, our sales overall sales were below target because late deliveries went up 60 percent in the western region um, of product X and people were complaining and unsatisfied right so you're starting to dig into these questions to find things that you can actually make changes to so we know that this this drop in overall um, sales right is actually because of these late deliveries so if we tackle that problem it should hopefully fix the rest of these because that's actually the the core problem 
And without business intelligence, we wouldn't be able to sort of dig into the data to find answers like that. Okay, so this is the end of chapter six. Um, the first of my four chapter um, chapter videos. Hopefully I didn't go too fast or too slow. But if I did, you can always listen to it again and again. <laughs> um, okay, so 